We're going to go ahead and start with meditation this session um, because that's the Thursday plan. So start with meditation. Um, if you'd like to get yourself into a nice posture. And I'll have the text on the screen, but if you would rather just listen, don't feel like you need to be looking at the screen. And this particular version of the practice isn't the one that's embedded in the Tara chapter. This is the one that can be found in the appendices at the very back of the book. So I'm uh, going to share it for you in a slightly bigger font version, but it's the same basic one as in the appendices. So just really be aware of your physicality and see if you can let go of any tension from the day. And shift your focus to the breath just for a minute or so, allowing the surface distractions to settle. If your breath is light or shallow, you simply know that that's the case. If it's deep and slow, you simply know that that's the case. Just being aware of the breath without trying to force or change anything. A gentle focal object. Letting the busyness of the day settle. and refuge. I take refuge in the Holy Guru, essence of all Buddhas, original grantor of all holy teachings, and Lord of all supreme beings. Please, Guru Buddhas, bestow on me the ability to unify my mind with the Dharma and to be successful in practicing Dharma in order to achieve the graduated path. May no hindrances occur while achieving this path.
please bless me to realize that I've received a perfect human rebirth, which is highly meaningful, for many reasons difficult to obtain, but perishable, transient, and fragile, decaying in the shortest moment because of its changeable nature. Thus my death is definite, but its actual time is most indefinite. And after death, I am far more likely to be reborn in the lower suffering realms, having created infinitely more negative than positive karma in this life and in all of previous lives. Please bless me to comprehend how incredibly unendurable is the suffering of the lower realms, that I might take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha with all my heart. Realize the evolution of karma in all its profundity, that I might perform only virtuous actions and abandon all negative creations. And so letting that small scope motivation settle in, trying to separate yourself from attachment to this life, seeking to create the momentum and merit for positive future lives, the inner legacy you leave yourself, supporting your path. Continuing, by practicing in this way, I will be reborn in the upper realms, but will still have to experience unlimited samsaric suffering because of uncontrolled delusion and karma. Please bless me to fully realize the evolution of samsara from uncontrolled rebirth to death to rebirth, and to follow day and night the three higher trainings of the path, higher conduct, higher concentration, and higher wisdom which are the main methods to release me from samsara. And so just take a minute and let your mind now elevate to the middle scope, expanding the motivation to not just want positive future lives and continuous practice, but to actually end samsara to achieve liberation. And continuing, but as each sentient being has been my mother, and as most of them are in extreme suffering, please bless me to bring success to all by renouncing the perfect happiness of self and practicing the bodhisattva's deeds of the six perfections with a bodhisattva's mind of exchanging self with others on the basis of equanimity meditation. Thus I shall have no sorrow in experiencing the samsaric suffering of all other sentient beings for no matter how long, having trained my mind in the general path. So elevating your motivation now to the great scope, the Mahayana. not just wishing to achieve freedom from samsara and liberation, but to achieve full Buddhahood, enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Expand the motivation there.
continuing. Please bless me to follow the quick Vajrayana teachings by feeling sentient beings suffering very unimaginably unbearable for even the shortest moment as my own and to achieve the attainment of Shakyamuni Buddha immediately at this very moment by keeping my ordinations and the instructions of the guru with the best and highest care in life for the sole purpose of enlightening all sentient beings. And so expanding that Mahayana motivation to be the Mahayana Vajrayana motivation, which wants to become enlightened swiftly and knows that if we want speed in our practice for the welfare of others, we need the grounding of renunciation, bodhicitta and the correct view that ethics are essential, as is altruism, as is wisdom. And that's why we practice Tantra, for the sake of others. And our own welfare getting achieved as a side effect. And now shift to visualize. Above the crown of my head, I visualize a lotus and a moon disc. Upon these is the great treasury of compassion, Aryatara, mother of all enlightened beings, who is oneness with my kind root guru. My guru is seated in the full lotus position within a transparent bubble of rainbow colored light is pink in complexion and wears saffron robes and a pandit's hat. His right hand is at his heart in the gesture of teaching the Dharma and holds a vajra and stem of a white lotus that blooms beside his right ear. His left hand rests on his hip. It holds a bell and the stem of another white lotus that blooms beside his left ear. So visualize and connect with the guru in the aspect of Lama Tsongkhapa. At my guru's heart is Aryatara, in female aspect, green in color and seated in the dancing posture within a rainbow bubble. Her left leg is bent up, her right leg is outstretched. Her left hand is at her heart in the mudra symbolizing the triple gem and holding the stem of a blue Utpali flower. Her right hand extended over her right knee is in the mudra of granting sublime realizations. She is beautifully adorned with jeweled ornaments and scarves. Stabilizing that. At the heart of the guru at the crown is green Tara.
Om, Ah, and Hum, mark her three places, crown, throat, and heart center, adding those syllables to the visualization, zeroing in on Tara specifically. At her heart is a lotus and moon seat, which stands a green syllable tum. Rays of green light radiate in all directions from the tum and invoke all the enlightened beings of the 10 directions. They are all absorbed into Aryatara and become one. And we make the heartfelt prayer. Please remain above my head until I receive enlightenment. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merit from giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merit from giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, by my merit from giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. So connect your refuge with the refuge above you visualized, the ideas and visualization mixing, and reinforcing your bodhicitta. With my body, speech, and mind, I devoutly prostrate. I offer all offerings, both real and imagined. All sins and offenses amassed from beginningless time, I confess. I rejoice in all virtuous actions of holy and ordinary beings. O oh, gurus and Buddhas, please remain until samsara ends and turn the wheel of dharma for sentient beings. All my virtues and those of all others I dedicate to the great enlightenment. This ground anointed with perfume strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. The objects of my attachment, aversion and ignorance, friends, enemies and strangers and my body, wealth and enjoyments. Without any sense of loss, I offer this collection. Please accept it with pleasure and bless me with freedom from the three poisons. Yadam Guru Ratnamandala Kamir Tayani. And we request, please bless me to purify all obscurations of my body so that it will become one in essence with Guru Tara's holy Vajra body. And think that in response, white light emanates from the Om at Arya Tara's brow and curves in an arc to enter my brow.
my body is purified completely of all obscurations and becomes one in essence with Guru Tara's holy Vajra body. Staying with that. This white light soothing, purifying, healing. All negativities of killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, anything unskillful we've done with our body, anything that is ripening as pain and suffering physically now, this white light purifying from her brow to yours. And we shift. Please bless me to purify all obscurations of my speech so that it will become one in essence with Guru Tara's holy Vajra speech. And in response, Tara sends red light emanating from the awe at her throat and curves in an arc to enter my throat. My speech is purified completely of all obscurations and becomes one in essence with Guru Tara's holy Vajra speech. Staying with that. The red light soothing, purifying, healing. All mistakes of lying, of divisiveness, harshness, idleness, anything harmful with your speech, getting purified. Any difficulties you're having in communication, being pacified. and shift. Please bless me to pure all obscurations of my mind so that it will become one in essence with Guru Tara's holy Vajra mind. And in response, Tara sends blue light emanates from the whom at Arya Tara's heart, curves in an arc to enter my heart. My mind is purified of all obscurations and becomes one in essence with Guru Tara's holy Vajra mind. Staying with that. Blue light, soothing, purifying, healing. All negativities of mind, 
covetousness and attachment, ill will, anger, hatred, wrong views, afflicted doubt, ignorance. and any stress and mental disturbance. Blue light soothing from her heart center to yours. and shift. Please bless me to purify all delusions and subtle obscurations to omniscience, so that my body, speech, and mind will become one with Guru Tara's holy body, speech, and mind. Now the three colored beams emanate simultaneously from the Om, Ah, and Hum syllables, curving in an arc and entering my three places completely purifying all my delusions and subtle obscurations to omniscience. My body, speech, and mind become one in essence with Guru Tara's holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. Staying with that. My root guru dissolves into Aryatara, who melts into green light, which flows into me. Instantly, my wrong conception that I and all other phenomena are self-existent, together with my dualistic mind and its views, disappear, becoming completely empty. Not even a trace of them remains and I concentrate one-pointedly on this empty state with the wisdom that is indistinguishably one with Guru Tara's blissful, omniscient mind.
staying with that. And then out of emptiness arises Tara in the space in front. At Tara's heart center is her mantra. She's facing you, holds you in her compassionate gaze, and simultaneously is aware of all sentient beings. The Tom and the mantra are manifestations of Guru Tara's holy mind. Green light radiates from all the letters. Spreading in every direction, it purifies the negative karmas, gross delusions, and subtle obscurations to omniscience of all sentient beings. Who also have Tara up here before them. Again, light radiates, bearing manifold offerings to the six transcendental senses of all the Buddhas and sentient beings. Stabilizing that. Think that the enlightened beings are extremely pleased and shower down the superlative qualities of Buddha Tara's holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. Omniscient wisdom, supreme power, and infinite compassion in the form of a great shower of light rays. As we recite the mantra, we absorb and are blessed by this rain. Om tare tu tare tu re soha. 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 And continue the mantra under your breath, together with the visualization.
and from Tara's heart emanates the 21 Taras, each skilled in dispelling the specific sufferings of beings, clearing obstacles, pacifying illness, soothing conflict. Imagine all 21 Taras are here in the space in front of us, facing us. And with awareness of those 21 Taras, we add the praises. For my prostrate to the noble transcendent liberator. Homage Tara swift heroic, guys like lightning instantaneous, sprung from opening stamens of the Lord of three worlds, tear born lotus. Homage she whose face combines a hundred autumn moons at fullest, blazing with light rays resplendent as a thousand star collection. Homage golden blue on lotus, water born in Hannah Dornet, giving ever calm austerities, patience, meditation, her sphere. Homage, crown of Tata Gattas, actions triumph without limit, relied on by conquerors' children, having reached every perfection. Homage, filling with Tutare, whom desire direction and space, trampling with her feet the seven worlds, able to draw forth all beings, Homage worshipped by the All-Lord, Chakra Hagni Brahma Maru, honored by the host of spirits, corpse rises, Gandavas, Yakshas, homage with her tray and pay sounds, destroying post-magic diagrams, her feet pressing left out right and blazing in a raging fire blaze, homage to a very dreadful destroyer of Marius champions, she with frowning lotus visage, who is slayer of all enemies, homage at the heart her fingers, adorn her with three jewel mudra, light ray masses all excited, all directions wheels adorn her, Homage, she so joyous, radiant, crown emitting gallons of light, mirthful laughing with Tutare, subjugating Mara's devas. Homage, she able to summon all earth guardians assembling, shaking, frowning with her womb sign, saving from every misfortune. Homage, crown adorned with crescent, moon all ornaments most shining. Amitabha in her hair not sending out much light eternal. Ahmed she mid wreath ablaze like eon ending fire abiding. Right left bent joy surrounds you, troops of enemies destroying. Ahmed she who strikes the ground with her palm and with her foot beats it, scowling with the letter whom the seven levels she does conquer. Homage, happy, virtuous, peaceful. She is filled as peace, nirvana. She endowed with omen, soha. Destroyer of the great evil. Homage to we, she with joy surrounded. Tearing foes' bodies asunder. Frees with human knowledge, mantra. Arrangement of the ten letters. Homage to re, with seed letter. Of the shape of syllable. By foot stamping shakes the three worlds, Mero, Mandra, and Vindhya. Homage holding in her hand the hammock moon of Deva Lake form, with twice spoken Tara and Pei, totally dispelling poison. Homage she who gods in their kings, and the Kinneras do honor, armored in a joyful splendor. She dispels bad dreams and conflicts. Homage she used to eyes bright with radiance of sun and full moon. With twice Hara and Tutare, she dispels severe contagion. Homage full of liberating. How by the set of three natures, destroys hosts of spirits, yakshas, and raise corpses supreme to re. These praises with the rule mantra and prostrations thus are twenty-one. And so feeling light and nectar coming from all twenty-one Taras.
Blessing your body, speech, and mind. They dissolve into light and absorb into you one by one. And we dedicate. May I quickly become Guru Aryatara and lead each and every sentient being into her enlightened state because of these merits. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Myself, Tara, her practice and its results are all empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. Okay, you can relax your attention. So that practice can be done with or without the praises, your choice. Um, when you do the praises, if the 21 Taras are familiar to you, you can think that they dissolve into you one by one. Or you can kind of think many into one and it's just mainly green Tara and she's sending light and blessings with each one. If that's easier for you, that's okay too. Um, when you're doing this practice, you can also do this as your purification at the end of the day, if you'd like. If you do that, just make sure you add the power of resolve and make that um, clear commitment about how you'll change behaviors in future so that all four Poena powers are complete. So it's a, it's a nice one, particularly for stress relief. Um, you can do it very simply, even without the sadhana in front of you. You know, just thank the guru with Tara at the heart. Om, <laughs> ah, whom, do the mantra. Think that it's purifying. Absorb and dedicate. So if you wanted to do a very simple version, even without the book in front of you, it would be a nice one to do. Do you have any questions about the practice before we have a little stretch? Thank you, Venerable. Um, first of all, your PowerPoint decks are always on point. They're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had two two things when I when we are at the so imagine touching senti sentient beings. I kind of get I have a very vivid imagination, and I I just get stuck on my neighbor or stuck on you know. And so it just becomes very kind of concrete. And yeah. I, that happens to me also with purifying my unskillful actions of body, speech, and mind. It's just like a highlight reel mm. starts going. And so, so if you have thoughts about how to work with that more skillfully. And then another thing just now, it it, it felt very um, powerful. And that happens to me sometimes. And when that, when that does, I get nauseous. Mm. I don't know if that's something that is is common or um but if you have thoughts about about those two things that'd be great yeah yeah th those are really um good practical like nuts and bolts practice questions and so i will i'll give you what my um my opinion and my experience has been but there is probably a lot of different ways to look at it so you know grain of salt but i think that when you're stuck on a visualization you're wanting all sentient beings you're thinking about all sentient beings but you get kind of clogged <laughs> or stuck um right. I think that it's similar to when you do an equanimity meditation and you pick three representatives of friend, enemy, stranger, and it's just three people you're thinking of, but they're the representatives of all mm -hmm. sentient things. I think that rather than try to force a visualization more broadly or skip anybody or add anybody, just kind of, you know, think all sentient beings. And if a couple specific ones are popping into your head, think of them as the representatives. Okay. Yeah. And then you won't kind of get um, like superstitious or stuck or feel like it's interrupting the flow of it. You can think, okay, those are the representatives of today, obviously. Interesting. They're popping into my mind. I may revisit that later. Anyway, <laughs> light, right? right. Um, you know, kind of a side note. So the thing that happens with, I think, a lot of these meditations, which are subtly tapping into chakras, even gently as this one does, is that you can get nauseous like you described. So it's so gentle, right? It's just light and then light and then light. And you're not even doing anything except for the light. 
And it's remarkable how powerful your mind is that just by inviting the holy mind and then thinking in that way, it can have an effect. Yeah. And so in, in one sense, it's really good news that you're connecting deeply with the practice. It could be that you're going in too hard in some way, and that's why it's turning into nausea. Um, also, it's possible that that's where you carry anxiety. Do you carry anxiety in your stomach more or your chest more, I wonder? Because sometimes it can be a resistance thing. Yeah. It's kind of the whole enchilada. Yeah, right. Probably in my stomach. Yeah, I, I do get, yeah. I get nauseous when I get upset. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'm guessing that that's, um, that navel chakra is possibly tighter than the other ones. So the, uh, the other three are kind of going, ah, oh, <laughs> which kind of invites all the other chakras that we're not particularly focusing on, but it kind of invites them to settle and release as well. And if they're, you know, a little tight because there's some stress from the day or something going on, it could be that it's having a, just kind of a subtly, a little bit of a difficult side effect. So okay. what I think to do is kind of ease off on the intensity of the light just gently Okay. Or what you might want to do is kind of pause that visualization and just have simple green light flowing straight down, kind of like a Vajrasattva meditation, kind of all the way down and through, all the way down and through in a really gentle way. And just kind of see if you can get your chakras and your nervous system a bit happy and then return to the meditation as written and see if that helps. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good questions. Yeah, weird stuff can happen. Unexpected stuff can happen. And, and I think we sometimes surprise ourselves that there is a, an effect just as ordinary as we are just doing it as written. And you're like, oh, okay, something. So it's, it's interesting to explore. Um, yeah, other, other questions about the practice? Or any bits that didn't make sense or you wanted to hear more about? This one has a, a particularly extended motivation at the beginning where you go through the three scopes of motivation. And so if you're not as you know up to speed with the Lam Rim or the graduated path to enlightenment, it might be that that motivation um, is a little confusing or you feel like you're missing pieces and that's completely okay. Just kind of make a mental note that you wanna ask some things about those. Um, yeah, Denise, go ahead. I find that actually that's very helpful because it helps me get out of my ego mind. Yeah. Um, so I find that very helpful. It's a nice motivation. It's a really nice one. I, I think um, it's worth doing a Lam Rim something before your practice. When you're building your own daily practice or you're adding to your own daily practice, some Lam Rim something at the beginning is really going to help. So whether it's that one or it's like a Lama Song Kappa prayer, like foundation of all good qualities or something, it's a good it's a good thing to do if you have the mental space for it and it resonates the way it seems to be resonating for you. If a Lamrim prayer is not resonating for you because either you haven't studied it enough or you're triggered by some point and you need to get it clarified, then just give yourself good time with refuge in bodhicitta at the beginning and give that more emphasis. Let's see, um, let's see. There was a question in the chat that it says, uh, visualize the guru and then it's Lama Tsongkhapa. Are we visualizing our guru and then Lama Tsongkhapa? Your guru is Lama Tsongkhapa subtle point right so it's kind of like the guru ness is taking the aspect of lama Tsongkhapa, and then at his heart is tara and then you're mostly just zooming in and focusing on tara for the most part and then when all of that absorbs and she reappears that's where it gets into if you don't have the empowerment she reappears in the space in front never mind lama Tsongkhapa. they're one in nature merge now it's just tara in front if you have the uh, empowerment, then you arise as Tara and you think one in nature with Tara and your guru. So when you're thinking of Lama Tsongkhapa as one in nature with the guru, that makes sense for you if you're Galupa, right? But if you're not a Galupa, you could swap and put in Guru Rinpoche instead. You know, it's kind of like we're trying to take a, an example of a human being who was an exemplar of the practice of the practice of study, of the practice of meditation, of the practice of benefiting sentient beings. 
And that exemplar of the best kind of guru takes that form. So all of your real life gurus that you've met in your life think that they merge with and are represented by Lama Tsongkhapa. Um, very well, I have, I was curious, what is the symbolism um, of visualizing you know, a deity in this case, Tara, the heart of the guru, and you know, other times it's Avalokiteshvara. So I know I always thought, like, why not just Tara, you know, on mm. top of my head, or why not just the guru? Like, why together like this? Mm. And there's always going to be some version of the guru deity, like hyphenated, right? Either the guru and the deity, or the guru deity. Either way, that's always going to be something that you're going to find, particularly at the top of the practice. Um, and it's tying into this idea in Tantra of what is merging into what is merging into what is merging into what. So you're trying to really get out of the ordinary conception of concreteness. And so when you're thinking the guru, you're, yes, thinking of your literal gurus that you've met in real life who have inspired your mind, but you're kind of thinking of them all in a mass and a merge yeah rather than like the literal humans you're trying to touch base to that dharmakaya mind of all the buddhas communicating through them so that is a formless thing so you have to give it a shape in order to relate to it the shape in this particular practice is lama Tsongkhapa, but it could be anything and then that becomes merged with the deity that you're practicing and in this case, the deity you're practicing is Tara. So what you're thinking is that all of the guru-ness of all of the gurus is taking one form, and then you're emphasizing action, protection, Tara-ness. And those two are kind of conceptually separate for a moment, just so that your practice is clear and organized and directed, and then they merge. And then later, they merge with you. So there's going to be all of these layerings and mergings in Tantra. And before you have the empowerment, it's just the guru deity are one in nature. L later, when you have the, have the empowerment, the guru, the deity, and you are all merged. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I think I'm, very, I'm, I'm much more clear about uh, the guru-ness. Mm -hmm. um, but the deity within the guru is that just to highlight a particular aspect that we want to focus on? Like in this case, you know, the qualities of Green Tara. And then when we choose Avalokiteshvara, it's to focus on that aspect? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's like the the Lama, once you kind of get yourself anchored on what is the guru, like cosmically, not like in the literal fleshy sense, but like what is the guru, you, you're stabilizing that. And then you're thinking for this purpose, they're taking the aspect of Tara. Just as in another practice, they that same energy would take the aspect of Chinrazi. Mm. Yeah, because that's what's being emphasized. And that all of them are all of them. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter except for they're relating to you and trying to stimulate something within you. And you're trying to bring a particular energy forefront and then be able to spread that outward. So hence now that energy taking this shape. Mm. And then, so like you said, yeah, also breaking through, I guess, the way I categorize and have concrete ideas of how things are and so forth, and really trying to make the mind more subtle to focus, yeah. like you said, on the dharmakaya aspect of the guru. And yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes, I was wondering if I could um, use the Dalai Lama as my guru. Yes. <laughs> Contemporary. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yeah, perfect. Especially um, if you don't have a guru yet, who's your stand-in? <laughs> he can be your stand-in. Um, you know, he is a, a special case, so he can be your stand-in for all tantric practices. And then when you have an empowerment, it's that teacher you took the empowerment from, but you can think that his holiness merges with that. You know, don't think of it too distinct. Like in the relative world, we have distinct people with distinct flesh and blood bodies, but the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas is a multifaceted phenomena made of all enlightened minds. So while there were individual mental continuums that developed on the path and perfected themselves, once they're finished, they're all of the same type and all completely aware of one another. And so it almost as if it becomes one thing, even though it's made up of countless consciousnesses that have transformed. 
Thank so. you. Yeah. Thank you, Venerable Yantin. So um, I ha I did the Tara Sidamani empowerment, mm -hmm. and yep. I'm still not clear. Is that the, is that, it's different. So who's Tara Sidamani? Is that the, the who's Tara Sidamani? <laughs> I, I do it every day, but I don't know why, how she's different from the 21, and she's kind of different. She's different in the sense that she's the highest yoga tantra aspect, but it's the same, same. It's just like, you know, you have Chen Rezig, forearm, thousand armed, Mahakala, you know, Hayagriva, you know, it's all Chen Rezig, but it's manifesting as different kind of sub forms right, for, lack right. of a better word, for a particular emphasis. So the Chittamani Tara practice has more layers of subtlety, but it's the variations on a theme. It's still that very strong connection with the Lama. It's still lots of work with chakras and energies. It's just the more elaborate in depth form of the same energy and the same intention. And can I use my guru as opposed to the guru that gave me the empowerment for my visualization or either one is okay? Well, the visualization is, is not none of them, right? The visualization is Lama Tsongkhapa, right? Lama Tsongkhapa. In my practice, it calls for my guru, I think, not Lama Tsongkhapa. Yeah, yeah, maybe in, in my sadhana. Yeah, we're not going to kind of talk about highest yoga tantra sadhanas in a common group. But oh, okay. if, yeah, but if it's your guru, think of some way that embodies the guru ness. And if it's your literal human guru, think of them in their healthiest form on their smiliest day. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and if. Um, in the, in the question, there was like a clarification about that, seeing the guru as Lama Tsongkhapa. I suppose we're supposed to visualize the guru who gave us the empowerment. You're supposed to think the guru who gave you the empowerment, but they take the shape of Lama Tsongkhapa. Do you see how it's challenging the concreteness, right? Again and again, we're challenging this kind of fixed idea because what are we relating to anyway with anyone? We have no idea. But we know that the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas pervades everywhere. And so if we engage with that, we will have interaction with that. Yeah. So the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas, particularly the Lama that gave you the empowerment and all of the ones that moved your mind, take this shape <laughs> for now. Helps you relate. I have, I would like to ask a, a question that was my question is, is it, what's the difference uh, with this practice like we had from uh, a sad, uh, sadhana, 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 it, that is, it is, is the same? Sadhana is just means practice manual. Oh, okay. Because I mean, it, it was looked like the sadhana once we had for a weekend from Tara with you, Venerable. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it it's, was like longer, right? Yeah, yeah. I so, think it was, it can be longer. Yeah, you just add, I just added the praise because you can add the praise. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, same. Yeah. I mean, Sadhana, I say a Sadhana is a practice manual. It is a practice manual. It usually implies there's a, a self-generation component, but that mm -hmm. self-generation component we're not doing in this common group. So sometimes you might see like a meditation on Tara or a meditation on Medicine Buddha, which may not have the self-generation in it. Yeah. But things yeah. are not tidy as we'd like them to be because sometimes they'll call it a meditation and it'll wind up being a self-generation anyway. So yeah. Just know what empowerments you have and practice. Yeah. And I remember you told me because it was very amazing for me with all the color and I was really in mm. it. And you, you said, don't um, ask it for like, don't attach to this every time. It's not every time that way. And this yeah. time I was so detached that I, I said, hmm, where am I? I was too detached. So um, I, I compare to this and to the sadhana and to the ones I do every day. So it's really interesting because it depends on what is in your mind, what is your day, what is it's so uh, uh, yeah independent uh, yeah it's thank you yeah yeah definitely yep you just have to meet yourself where you are each day day by day because we are changing all the time <laughs> sometimes getting worse sometimes getting better sometimes holding steady right um in your chat you were asking about special prayers um for iran um and countries at war and um 
that's timely because I was thinking that we could add that to our practice tonight. There is one of the Taras that is particularly about war and conflict. So I shall pop her up there. Here she is. And um, so Yule Gyalma, Yule Gyalma is, um, is the Tara manifestation that particularly assists with war. And as you can see, she is semi wrathful and she has a halo of flames as opposed to just nice pretty orb of light. So this particular practice, there's just a very short, short, short version. And it's, uh, her name is Tara who gains victory over war. She's renowned for protecting against all the obstacles related to wars. She can reverse the march of armies to stop the war completely. Her protection also applies inwardly too, as she stops hostile emotions born of conceptual thinking that disturb our awareness and wisdom that might lead us to warlike actions. So basically you just visualize her prey, you visualize her sending light to all areas of conflict. So particularly Iran or particularly Ukraine, you think that she's sending light out and you think, and you say, homage mother residing amidst the garland that places like the fire at the end of the world era, right leg extended, left bent, encompassed by joy annihilating hosts of enemies. And so, of course, the enemy is the anger and the hatred. We're not talking about one side winning and another side losing. We're talking about may the enemy of anger, the enemy of hatred, the enemy of greed, all of the things fueling the war be annihilated. So um, basically just visualize her light going out, say that prayer, and then you kind of hold the image of light going out to those areas and you can add the regular Tara mantra, Om Tari Tu Tari Turi Soha, and then dedicate, may there be world peace and may all of that lead to enlightenment. So um, I'll send that in the email when I send you your follow-up email tomorrow for this week. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, it's important. So let's have a five minute break and um, and then we'll do a bit on the 21 Taras. Jazz <laughs> 
So for the rest of this session, I thought we would just go through the 21 Taras gently and look at their pictures and think happy thoughts about them. <laughs> Simple as that, yeah. And kind of make a mental note of any particular ones that are going to come in handy for your life as it is now, right in this moment, because it's nice to do all 21, but you can, it's also completely fine to zero in on one and just do a very gentle practice, light praise, her mantra related to one. So that can be quite nice. So when we're thinking about the 21 Taras, again, don't get too concrete, but also still think this is all Tara-ness. So one nice way to kind of picture it is, okay, your ordinary self as you are right now, there are people in your life or times and places where you kind of manifest in a very specific way to suit the minds of those people. And it's not like you're a different person, is it? It's just you're eliciting a particular energy. Like, uh, like I was recently driving from Montana to California, and I noticed that my affect slightly shifted state to state. Right? So when I was in Montana with my hometown people, there was a certain um, rural sort of drawl to my voice that I didn't even realize could happen and a certain folksiness that would manifest, especially with gas station attendants. Yes, a certain folksiness, a certain low-key kind of chill vibe, kind of smiley, kind of self-deprecating, knowing, yes, yes, I do look strange. I am aware of that. Thank you for noticing. But, you know, like with kind of a humor, right? And then moving into kind of different areas of like Idaho, Oregon, down, you know, moving down, I could notice that if I couldn't read the people as well, then there was more formality, but also trying to be friendly and things shifted and shifted. And then I got to California and I noticed that um, the way people looked at me was different because I'm less, what the hell? And more Ah, cool, you know, because California, right? And so then my affect slightly shifted and uh, I didn't have such a folksiness, such a ruralness, you know, and all of it is me, right? All of it is the spectrum of personality choices I could choose from. I'm not a different person each place, but I'm going to emphasize something based on what's going to communicate with them the best. Right? And you know how you are with your different circles of friends and your different family members. You elicit different aspects of yourself in order to connect more deeply, in order to put them at ease, in order to be effective in your communication. So, so think of the 21 Taras as like the elevated version of that. Yeah, so there's Tara, but then she's going to manifest this way for that and this way for that and this way for that and this way for that. But it's all Tara and Ness. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. All right, let's look into them. And this is all straight from the book. So if you get lost, you can look back at the book and I will of course send you the slides later. So this is from Ribeche. He says, there are different traditions regarding the 21. So you might see images of them that differ slightly. There is one tradition according to the great translator Pari Latzawa where there are peaceful looking Taras and wrathful looking ones, and some have many arms. There is also a tradition from Lama Atisha, where each only has one face and two arms, but some have different colors and one or two are wrathful. So I will describe the 21 Taras found in the Lama Atisha tradition. The simple way to visualize the 21 Taras 
as you recite the praises is to visualize green Tara in the center with the 21 surrounding her clockwise on a 21 petaled lotus, each on a petal and a moon disc. One tradition says that as you recite the praise to each Tara, you imagine Tara, that Tara sending out an emanation that absorbs into you, giving you that specific quality. So the picture we have here is in the tradition of Lama Atisha, which is the tradition that Lama Zopa Rinpoche and that we practice in our tradition the most commonly. Um, but all of them are good and correct. It's just good to know what the source is. So when you're looking at them, there's the numbers. So starting with the red one under Tara's foot, yeah, one, two, three, four, and then up and around and down and around. So the first Dalai Lama, Gendon Drup, wrote the commonly used sadhanas that we use for Tara. The version of the praises that we use is a translation by Pongo Chempo. And the common order of Taras, as in the praises, is the clockwise in this spiral. So that's the order of the praises. That's the order of them in our tradition. Um, and so we did the other version of the visualization during um, the praises. So if it's too difficult to imagine each Tara absorbing into you, you can just imagine the principal Tara sitting at the center of a lotus on a moon disc. As you say the praises with your hands in the prostration mudra, you imagine purifying beams coming from principal Tara's heart and entering your heart. Then at the end, imagine that a replica of Tara absorbs into your heart and your body, speech, and mind become with Tara, one with Tara's holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. So that's what I mentioned before. So number one, uh, swift lady of glory, homage Tara, swift heroic, eyes like lightning instantaneous, sprung from opening stamens of the Lord of Three Worlds, tear-born lotus is her praise. So on the first petal is Tara, the swift lady of glory, red in color. She is the quick one, holding in her right palm a red flask for controlling. She grants the ability to influence sentient beings so they will listen to you and you can lead them to the Dharma. Her mantra is this, Om Tari Tutari Turi Washam Kuru Soha. So whenever you see something about controlling or um, power or manifesting or anything like that, the red category, <laughs> um, red loosely, not always, Remember that it's not about manipulation, it's not about dominance, it's not about anything that's a power trip. It's not about competitiveness. This is about influencing sentient beings to bring out the best in them and influencing sentient beings by being a powerful condition for them to connect what is positive. Okay, so when you see controlling, don't think ordinary ways of controlling. Then we have Lady of Supreme Peace. Homage, she whose face combines a hundred autumn moons at fullest, blazing with light rays resplendent as a thousand star collection. So on the second petal is Tara, lady of supreme peace, white in color, holding a white flask containing nectar for pacifying disease. Her mantra is this, Om Tare Tu Tare Turi Shantam Kuri Soha. So pacifying or peaceful activities, usually depicted by white deities, but not pervasively. Pacifying means to bring peace to. So it could be, in this case, pacifying disease, but also could be pacifying conflict or pacifying stress, in this case, disease. Lady of golden yellow color, homage golden blue and lotus, water born and hand adorned, giving effort calm austerities, patience meditation, her sphere. On the third petal is golden colored Tara, giver of supreme virtue. Go yellow golden color holding in her hand a yellow flask containing the nectar for increasing life and fortune. Her mantra is this, Om Tare Tu Tare Turi Pushtum Kuru Soha. So increasing life and fortune, this is about basically all forms of vitality. Yeah, resource vitality, inner vitality, health and well-being. Lady of complete victory, embodying all positive qualities. Homage crown of Tathagatas, actions triumph without limit, relied on by conqueror's children, having reached every perfection. On the fourth petal is Tara completely victorious, embodying all positive qualities, yellow in color, 
holding a yellow flask containing nectar for increasing lifespan. Her mantra is this, Om Tari Tu Tari Ture Arya Jana Pushtum Kuru Soha. So increasing lifespan doesn't ever mean adding on life to the end of your life. Whatever your throwing karma was for this particular body, it's already been thrown. However long you're going to live is however long you're going to live, except if you have the karma for untimely death. So if you have untimely death karma, it could be that this body has been projected to live for 95 years, but your untimely death karma could come when you're 55. So by praying to a Tara of this type, you're clearing the untimely death karma so that you can live out your full complete lifespan uninhibited. She who proclaims the sound of whom? Homage filling with tutare, whom desire direction and space, trampling with her feet the seven worlds, able to draw forth all beings. On the fifth petal is Tara proclaiming the sound of whom? Red yellow in color, holding a red flask containing nectar with the function of enchanting other sentient beings, causing them to be attracted to you in a way that's not creepy or harmful. Right. And in this depiction, um, Fred Vanderzee, who is the author I, or who is the artist I use a lot because his images are freely offered. He's not putting so much the red tinge in it, but you get the sense of her yellowness and enchanting sentient beings, causing them to be attracted to you. What we're really talking about is charisma, but charisma from a positive perspective that's going to, again, bring out the best in others. She is completely victorious over the three realms. Homage worshipped by the All Lords, Chakra, Agni, Brahma, Maru. Honored by the host of spirits, corpse raisers, Gandavas, Yakshas. On the sixth petal is Tara, completely victorious over the three worlds, red, black, and color, who is victorious over the three realms. She holds a blue flask containing the nectar that intoxicates the spirits. Her mantra is this. Om Tari to Tari Turi, Shantrum. Uchata Taya Soha. By intoxicating the spirits, they become unable to function and so unable to cause harm to others. I guess it's a bit like taking a business client to dinner and getting them drunk, making it a lot easier to get them to agree to any deal you have to make. So uh, Lama Zoparimshe is hilarious. That's a funny example. Um, <laughs> but again, what you're wanting to do is to distract harm doers so that they can't cause obstacles hopefully by making a karmic connection with harm doers like spirits that are troublemakers. Later, when their minds mature and their karma settles a bit, you'll be able to teach them dharma. But it could be right now in this state, they're not teachable. They're just stuck in their habit of mischief. So you need to somehow distract them so they don't cause obstacles. She who conquers others. Homage with her tray and pay sounds, destroys, destroying foes magic diagrams, her feet pressing left out right in, blazing in a raging fire blaze. On the seventh petal is Tara who conquers others, black in color, destroying those possessing black magic. She has a slightly wrathful appearance, her forehead is wrinkled, and she holds a black flask containing the nectar that averts mantras and black magic sent against you. Her mantra is this. Om Tari Tu Tari Turi Sara Vidya Apara Bara Naya So Ha. So again, when wrath is needed, when people are actively plotting, which doesn't happen that often, but in the rare case that people are actively wanting to do the wrong thing to you in a really calculated way, this can clear that, or at least assist. She who conquers Mara's and enemies, homage Tari, very dreadful, destroyer of Mara's champions, she with frowning lotus visage, who is slayer of all enemies. So she's red, black in color. Her right hand holds a red flask containing nectar whose function is to defeat Mara's and enemies. Of course, Mara's are the inner Mara's that are disturbing our path. Om Tari to Tari Tari, Sara Maya, Shantu Maraya, Pe Soha. She who protects from all fears, homage at the heart her fingers, adorn her with the three jewel mudra. Light ray masses all excited, all directions wheels adorn her. The ninth petal is Tara who protects from all fears, her gestures signifying the three rare sublime ones. 
<clears throat> she holds a white flask containing nectar whose function is to protect all sentient beings from fear and dangers. Her mantra is this, Om Tari Tu Tari Ture Mama Aparana Raksha Raksha Soha. If there are dangers such as earthquakes, floods, typhoons, or the like, like Florida, right? You can take some strong refuge and recite this mantra or visualize Tara in front of you. So we won't have time to get through all of them. Um, you can read it in your own time. But basically, you see how it's a repeated theme of white, yellow, red, occasionally black, blue, white, yellow, yellow, <laughs> right, red, white. These are the colors that you find with the 21 Taras with very occasional ones that are black. So these two publications are really good at explaining the emphasis and also a more elaborate practice that goes with each of these. But basically they're breaking down into peaceful ones that are white, that pacify this and that, increasing ones that are yellow, controlling ones that are red and wrathful ones that are black. So they basically break down into those four main categories and then details apply and you can read those easily enough. But these two publications are free to download. The one from Kensa Rinpoche, Lama Lundra is from Lama Wishi, yes, she Wisdom Archive. And then the one from Geshe Dawa, you can find through Happy Monks publications. And so both of those websites are really excellent if you um, haven't found them already because they have tons of free resources. So just kind of like, what do they look like in their other form? Um, they're more likely to have an obvious different implement when we're not doing the Lama Atisha version. See how there's this conch here on top of the lotus? Yeah, and here there's a mirror. And here there's a Norbu. So in the other traditions, they have kind of more specified implements. In the tradition of Lama Atisha, they're basically all holding a vase and the nectar of that vase base, we say base, don't we? Face, the nectar of that vase <laughs> goes to the sentient being helping them in that way. So uh, the Lama Atisha visualization is somewhat easier because they're all one face, two arms holding a vase. The um, Lotsawa tradition one, they all have a specific little implement and some of them have more arms. In, in any case, much of a muchness. Um, do you have any questions about the 21 Taras or um, curiosities? Uh, could this be an alternative practice to the 35 Buddhas? I mean, it's an interesting question. Certainly, it, certainly doing Tara practice is very, very purifying, certainly. The emphasis of Tara, though, is kind of supporting health, long life, vitality, connections to different practices and resources, it has a slightly different emphasis than the 35 Buddhas. The 35 Buddhas, when they were practitioners on the path, made such deep prayers, such consistent deep prayers, specifically to help us purify negative karma of various types. It's kind of like, it's so powerful, I wouldn't say instead of, right? There, I mean, it's all good. Whenever you're practicing with a pure heart, it's going to be beneficial. And one practice alone can lead you to enlightenment, but terms and conditions apply, right? And those terms and conditions are, you need to have the practice fully fledged with all aspects complete. And some practices don't explicitly list all of those aspects that need to be complete in order to purify your mind. So you don't really need all this elaboration and all of this detail and all of this specificity if you have deep imprints and realizations. But for us at our level, it helps to have a few different tools to start clearing stuff. So we'll talk about the 35 Buddhas towards the end of the course. Um, and if it's a practice that you don't feel particularly connected with, that is not the end of the world at all. Vajrasattva will get the job done, Tara will get the job done. But there is a special depth to working with the 35 Buddhas and a special way of purification to do with them that is worth adding to your practice if you have mental space for it. Yeah, so I wouldn't say instead of. So I guess don't feel like you need to crowd your practice with a million things. Do some kind of purification each day. Yeah, but if you know that there is 
a lot of power in doing the 35 Buddhas, particularly with the prostrations, because you're also purifying all sorts of physical karma by going all the way up, all the way down. Yeah, as well as visually, as well as mentally, it can be a very engaging practice that kind of uses your whole body, your whole mind, your whole speech, everything is in kind of engaged when you do 35 Buddhas. So try it before you say, I don't want to do it. But if you don't want to do it, do Vajrasattva, you'll be right. How's that? Can I also ask? Um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so is the seven limb prayer also considered a, a, a strong purification? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, the seven limb prayer is going to be the most effective when you do it in a meditative form. So it's built mm -hmm. into most practices, right? Just very, And we just briefly touch them. But if you want the seven limb prayer to be your purification practice, make sure it has all four opponent powers. So you'll be like, reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind, and am connecting with refuge. Yeah, every offering I make, visual and imagined. Yeah, and all sins and offenses from beginningless time, I confess, pause there, and really meditate on the power of regret. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And then the power of rejoicing, you can think is part of the remedy. Yeah, because it's merit making, right? Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, yeah, I rejoice in the virtues of all ordinary beings and arias. Yeah. And then please remain until the end of cyclic existence. Really um, deepen the remedy practice by thinking, okay, please remain until the end of cyclic existence. I'm visualizing then offering a beautiful lion throne that the Guru Buddha sits on. Yeah, and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. You imagine offering a giant Dharma chakra that the Guru Buddha happily accepts. Yeah, and then before you get to, I dedicate the merits of myself and others, take a minute to meditate on the power of resolve. Okay. And then dedicate. So the Thank seven limbs on their own, absolutely very, very strong purification. But if you want it to be your purification practice, you'll have to make sure you consciously add in the power of resolve. Okay. And make sure that, you know, refuge came before. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a very quick, efficient way of purifying the mind and gathering virtue, that seven limb prayer. So it's like we just plug it in all the time because at least you're getting the job done in the sadhana. That the beginning parts of all sadhanas feel like they're preliminaries to the main practice, but they're actually foundations for the main practice. So don't just kind of run over them to get to the fun, pretty love and light stuff really anchor yourself in them because it'll support the rest of it. Yeah. Okay, so we'll go ahead and dedicate and um, next week we'll do some white Tara and go from there. So finish chapter four if you haven't already. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Thanks everyone. Have a Thank good you. night. Thank you, Venerable. Thank you. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.